This is Duke University. Welcome to this lecture put on by the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. We um, bring, um, as part of our center, we bring some of the leading figures in intellectual property to come and speak here. And today, um, the same is true, but in this case, we're introducing one of our own. Jennifer Jenkins is the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. She is a lecturing fellow, a senior lecturing fellow at the law school, teaching classes in intellectual property, the public domain, and free speech, and in music's copyright. She's also um, the author of a number of things, um, a comic book, which she co-authored with me, another one that she's going to talk about uh, today, um, and an article, a very uh, prescient article, on the um, American system of protecting, or in this case not protecting, fashion designs in intellectual property. Um, Jennifer is uh, a frequently quoted uh, academic in the media. She's recently appeared in the New York Times, Newsweek, and on NPR. And today she's going to be talking uh, to us about her research project on the history of music. Jennifer. Why did Plato argue that remixing music should be banned by the state? Why did the Holy Roman Empire encourage the use of musical notation? What threats were jazz and rock and roll supposed to present to society in mainstream culture? Would the development of genres like jazz and soul even be possible under today's legal regimes? These are some of the topics I'm going to talk about today, but with a twist. I'm going to describe to you a research project that Professor Boyle and I have been working on for about four years, a project that focuses on the history of musical borrowing and over a 2,000-year exploration of the way that norms, aesthetics, law, politics, technology, economics have influenced the conditions of creativity in music and tried to limit the mutability of musical forms. The project has taken us in some interesting directions. For example, in 2006, uh, we co-taught with Professor Anthony Kelly, who is in this room, um, a course composed of half law students, half graduate level composers that examined the way that musicians on the one hand and copyright law on the other hand view different types of musical borrowing. But the component of the project that I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different. So as anyone in our students' generation knows, we're currently in the midst of the music wars. On the one side, you hear about a whole generation of lawbreakers pirating and remixing music without authorization, completely indifferent to artists' needs. On the other hand, you hear about record companies resorting to the law to prop up an obsolete business model while trying to criminalize new forms of creativity and access enabled by technology. Now what our research showed us is that both of these accounts are both inaccurate and ahistorical, and that the history of music that I'm going to talk about can actually teach us a lot about today's debates. So we wondered, how should we present all of these findings to the public? So one of the goals of our center is, and of the law school as a whole, is translation taking abstruse legal or academic findings and research and making those findings available and accessible to a wider audience. So the form that we chose for translation in this instance is one that we used successfully in the past to explain fair use and copyright law to documentary filmmakers, namely a comic book. That's, he was very generous with the way that's me that's Professor Boyle flying in his, actually his suit looks very much like the one he's wearing here. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, that's actually Professor Kelly. Um, and, and these are all the, the lawyer zombies. Um, so the comic book is called Theft, A History of Music. It's being co-authored by Professor Boyle from the law school, by me, and by Professor Keith Aoki, who works at um, the University of California at Davis. 
And while I'm going to tell you a little bit about our findings on musical borrowing, I'm also going to tell you about the adventures, frustrations, <laughs> delights of trying to present 2,000 years of history in the form of a comic book. So my first theme today is that the struggle to control music is a very old one. There's something different about music. As we did our research, one of the things that struck us most was that music arouses very strong fears and very strong feelings that lead to persistent, repeated attempts throughout history to regulate and control music, whether legally, aesthetically, or culturally. This is particularly true when it comes to remix. Throughout history, there has been a persistent urge to police the boundaries of musical forms and genres. So to take one example, here is Plato, as promised, inveighing against the dangers of musical remix over 2,000 years ago. In Plato's voice, this is the point to which, above all, the attention of our rulers should be directed, that music and gymnastic be preserved in their original form and no innovation made. Any musical innovation is full of danger to the whole state and ought to be prohibited. So Plato is arguing that musical innovation should be banned by the state. Now, the mixing of ancient musical modes, such as the Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, etc., is obviously not the same as Max to Known mashing up Radiohead and Jay-Z, Jadiohead, or DJ Earworm mashing up the year's greatest pop hits. But it's still fascinating to find that over 2,000 years ago, people were still arguing about banning a form of mashup. So, why would that be? Well, if you see music as a reflection of the order of the cosmos, as the Greeks did, or as a, mu a mode of communication that can jump the firewall of the brain and communicate directly to the emotions, then of course you would worry about remix. Because the results of the wrong remix could be dramatic. <laughs> Star Spangled banger, Banner not being well received by the, the, the ancient Greeks. So now, the Platonist view of music may seem outmoded, pun, <laughs> so to speak. Most of, us are, most of us aren't Platonists anymore. But the belief in music's subversive power about the danger of crossing musical boundaries is an enduring one. So these boundaries might be religious, as with contrafactum and sacred secular borrowing in the Middle Ages, or cultural, or even racial. So this is the cover of the 1924 issue of Etude magazine that um, was brought to my attention, actually given to us by Professor Anthony Kelly here, from the music department featuring the opinions of prominent public men, there's actually, there are actually women featured in there, but the cover says men, and musicians on the jazz problem. What's the problem? Here's a quote that I'm going to read from one composer with rather racist concerns about stylistic mingling. Uh, he said, is from, from this issue, jazz is to real music what the caricature is to the portrait. If jazz originated in the dance rhythms of the Negro, it was at least interesting as the self-expression of a primitive race. When jazz was adopted by the highly civilized white race, it tended to degenerate it towards primitivity. So here the boundaries that are being policed are as much racial as they are musical. And this theme continued, whether it was composers such as this one worrying about the corrupting powers of jazz on white music in the 1920s, or a few decades later, segregationists in the American South that wanted rock and roll banned because they saw it as a subversive crossing of lines by black R&B music that might corrupt, among other things, white womanhood and fill their heads with pounding rhythms and an attraction for African-American performers. These are real quotes. I don't know if you can see them um, from Asa Carter, who was George Wallace's speechwriter. In other words, the segregationists thought that this was a form of musical miscegenation that would lead to actual miscegenation 
music lines were race lines, and crossing them was dangerous. This is, this is, this is um, a preacher from the same amount of time, and that's one of his quotes. Rock and roll inflames and excites the youth like jungle tom-toms. So as you can see, Plato has had many strange intellectual companions over the years. So one of the things we want this comic book to show is the way that policing the lines between the musical genres was actually seen as having a vital cultural role. Now related to remix is the phenomenon of musical borrowing. So these days, certain forms of, borrowing, certain forms of music that relied on borrowing and quotation are seen as high culture. Take classical music. Here is Brahms, whose first symphony bore so many similarities to Beethoven works that the conductor Hans von Bülow called it Beethoven's Tenth, uh, much, much to Brahms' annoyance. There's, there are many translations of that particular quote, and you know, I had to choose this one, but I wasn't able to find the definitive translation. But you get the gist. Uh, he didn't like it. And of course, this is only one of thousands of examples because many forms of borrowing were accepted as fundamental compositional techniques during the various eras of classical music. There are actually distinct types of borrowing, each viewed as legitimate in its own way. So, how are we going to present this musicological research in comic book form? We went with the classics. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers, except for it's Super Barrio Brothers. Barrio is a 20th century composer whose composition Symphonia borrowed from everyone. I'll just list a few. Mahler, Schoenberg, W.C. Berg, Brahms, Ravel, Stravinsky, Beethoven, Strauss, Bach, just to name a few composers. Um, Super Mario Brothers. So, in these slides, you can see, we, we, tried, we tried to be faithful to the game. Um, we described some of the different types of borrowing, such as modeling, for example. So uh, John Williams' theme from Star Wars is modeled on whole composition of the planets. Or quotations, uh, Tchaikovsky's, Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture conjures the Russian and French armies by quoting their national anthems. So extensive borrowing has been a part of many genres. Take jazz as another example, where borrowing and quotation were essential to improvisation. Dizzy Gillespie, pretty good rendition, I think. Uh, famous quote, you can't steal a gift. So of course, now we see many of these kinds of borrowing as high art, not as something that is shady or reprehensible. But years from now, Will this also be the fate of today's hip hop artists, whose borrowing, whose sampling is often condemned as theft? Your Honor, what I'm doing is really no different than what the esteemed Snoop Dogg or Lil Wayne did in the early days of the 21st century. You dare compare yourself to a classical rapper? <laughs> well, we shall see if this, is, if this is the future we have to look forward to. So, the first theme today is the struggle to control music is a long one and has patterns that repeat. And the struggle frequently has overt political or cultural overtones. It is a battle over the shape of culture. And persistent concerns about remixing music all the way from Plato to the present have existed alongside a long and rich tradition of borrowing in music. So that's our first theme. Moving on to my second theme, Technology. Technologies are unruly. So the history of music is bound up with technologies that enable its production, its reproduction, its distribution. And I mean technologies in the widest sense, everything from musical notation to player pianos, gramophones, high quality printing presses, all the way through to peer-to-peer -to -peer file sharing. So one conclusion that emerged from our historical research in this area is that we, our society, um, our lawmakers, are remarkably bad at predicting the effects of new technologies. So one great example is the process of musical notation itself. The ancient Greeks and Persians had musical notation of a sort. And in fact, um, some of the manuscripts are remaining. This is an actual manuscript um, of early uh, Greek notation. So there is some debate on whether we can actually read that notation and figure out what the music sounded like. Uh, 
This is how we described it in the comic book. But the skill of notation after that was lost in the West and wasn't reinvented until sometime in the ninth century. So here's the Guidonian hand, a 12th century mnemonic device to help singers sight sing from notation. Why was notation reinvented? The Holy Roman Empire played a prominent role in spreading and encouraging the use of notation. Its goal was a simple one, uniformity and control over sacred church music. So until the reinvention of notation to ensure a standard form of music, they actually sent around a standard reference choir to sing in each of the cathedrals of the empire to make sure that it was one church, one mass, one song. Notation meant they didn't have to do this anymore. It meant that the church's dictates about music, only monophonic music, only the human voice, no accompaniment, only the approved tunes and chants could be imposed from afar, bringing musical uniformity to the breadth of the empire, or so they thought. By the way, we time travel in the book, and, and we do so in uh, the Doctor Who TARDIS, which is hurtling through space there. Um, another one of our decisions in presenting it. So in fact, of course, notation did something very different as well. It allowed composers to experiment in ways that they could never have done before, particularly in polyphonic music, music with multiple melody lines. It allowed the sharing and the borrowing of music by people who had never met face to face or ever heard the same live piece of music. So notation, a technology intended to produce uniformity to squelch experimentation and remix actually ended up enabling all of those things. So time and time again, our confident predictions about the effect of new technologies and regulation on music turn out to be outdone by events. And it's not clear that we're much better today in predicting the effects of technology than we were in the Holy Roman Empire. So a slightly more recent example from the early 1900s. Another theme, when technologies change the patterns of costs and benefits, incumbents turn to the state for recourse. So in the late 19th century, the disruptive technologies of the day were player pianos. Has anyone ever seen? I always talk to my students about that. And some, people, some people have heard of them, some people haven't. There's a little mechanical piano roll, and it actually makes the piano play the ragtime music or whatever it is um, that you're into. So at the time, copyright law only covered the printing and public performance of musical compositions. It did not cover the mechanical reproduction for making a player piano roll or a disc or cylinder for phonographs or gramophones. Here's some of the technology that we're talking about. So the composers and music publishers, when these new technologies came out, went to Congress claiming that these technologies were effectively stealing their property and demanding that the law, the copyright law, should be changed to reflect that fact and ensure remuneration for every one of the piano rolls um, or discs that was produced. So here is composer John Philip Sousa, who you may be familiar with, his marches, which you played in marching band, or at least I did, and if you were unlucky enough to be subjected to that in high school. Um, so here's John Philip Sousa. These companies, the people producing these, these player pianos, uh, gramophones, take my property and put it on their records. That disc, as it stands, without the composition of an American composer like me on it, is not worth a penny. What makes, uh, put the composition of an American composer on it, and it's worth $1.50. Things were cheaper back then. What makes the difference? The stuff that we write. You should have to pay us for making these things, right? We should change the law to reflect that fact. Now, the nascent recording industry, the people who were making these new technologies, disagreed. First of all, they denied that there was any theft going on, and they rejected the notion of absolute property rights. They argued that copyright was a creature of statute, already reflecting a careful balance struck by Congress. So here is Philip Morrow from the American Graphophone Company Association. All talk about dishonesty and theft in this connection from however high a source is the merest claptrap, for there exists no property in ideas musical, literary, or artistic, except as defined by statute. Second, they did not think that the copyright holders should automatically reap the benefits 
of an entirely new market that didn't exist before that had been created by technological innovation, the innovation of the companies that they represented. So the, the piano roll industry representative pointed out that new, tech, new recordings were not doing any harm to composers. It is therefore perfectly demonstrable that the introduction of automatic music players has not deprived the composer of anything he had before their introduction. The composers are still getting paid for sheet music, right? They're in the status quo, they're the same as before. Why should we have to pay them for an entirely new market that we came up with? And here's a quote that's not on there. Um, this is Philip Morrow again from the Graphophone Association. Um, they're very eloquent back then. The composers and publishers have not contributed in the slightest degree to this change, yet the publisher does not scruple to demand radical change of legislation in order to give him the entire monopoly of the benefits resulting from these change conditions and has the effrontery to apply vituperative epithets to those who venture to oppose his scheme of greed. <laughs> They're good, huh? So, yes, in this case, the recording industry was citing with new technologies and the freedom to copy and against copyright expansion. So what's fascinating besides that fact about these debates is the depth of discussion about how to allocate the new surplus, the new benefits that are created by new technologies. In this case, before these new technologies, if you wanted to hear a song, you had to sing it or you had to play it, right? You needed an intermarry. I mean, it's hard to imagine now. Was, How, what does that song sound like? Well, you do have an orchestra, they can play it for you. <laughs> um, now with these, you can actually listen to it without a human intermediary. And that's pretty neat. And so these discussions um, actually talked about policy. New revenues did not automatically flow to the copyright holders or to the technologists. Rather, there was a policy debate that took into account the dangers of monopoly, the benefits of technological <coughs> progress, the public interest, and the advancement of knowledge and culture. And ultimately, Congress compromised. It issued a compulsory license saying that once a composer allowed a song to be recorded, any can re anyone could record it, um, make one of these piano rolls or one of these discs, as long as they paid a standard flat fee at the time, two cents. How did we present this compromise in the comic book form? We wrote a little ditty. <laughs> this is, this is, this is, this is Boyle. We're a little silly sometimes in the comic. We sort of are very, one of my students said, your puns remind me of the kind of puns my uncle makes. And I was like, well, your uncle must be a very, very funny man. <laughs> um, I don't think he intended it as a compliment, but I took it, I took it as one. So. First, we talked about remix and borrowing in our technology theme. Uh, technologies are unruly, we're bad at predicting their effects, and they change the pattern of costs and benefits. And when this happens, incumbents tend to try to grab the full scope of the new surpluses or the new benefits, but externalize the costs. Now, if I were advising a music client, I may very well take that position. It would benefit my client, but it's not the only position. And comparing some of the current debates going on as we speak about new intellectual property legislation to the debates in 1909, it seems as though we might have been more sophisticated back then. Third theme, we've done remix, we've done technologies, and now we're on to the law, the most exciting part. It's like in a relay race, you know, the three you put like the slowest guy. Here's the, here's the law, no, it's actually pretty cool. Um, so, our generation has a different relationship to musical culture than any other in history. When did intellectual property law start getting involved in this whole scheme in regulating music? Music has not always been subject to copyright protection, nor have there always been copyright laws. Um, and the kind of copyright protection we're accustomed to today has only regulated music for a tiny, tiny sliver of its history. So now, after the printing press was developed in a renaissance, states did grant um, Look how cool that is, this early printed music from the early 1500s. Um, they did grant certain printing privileges. So the Italian music publisher Petrucci, who developed an intricate, laborious, and innovative way of printing music, actually got an exclusive right for 20 years over all musical printing in Venice. Come the, the Microsoft of Matterballs. That's another one of Boyle's um, jokes. Um, but these printing rights went to the publishers, okay, not to the composers not to the authors. 
It was in 1710, those of you who are taking copyright know, that the first copyright law, the Statute of Anne in Great Britain, actually gave authors the rights okay, over their creations. But this new law was not applied to music until 19, I mean, 1777, when J.C. Bach, the English Bach, who was the 18th, 18th child, busy guy of J.S. Bach, um, brought a lawsuit. And the court found that musical compositions could actually be writings that were covered by the statute. But the statute only covered the reprinting of music. It did not cover the kinds of borrowing that we've been talking about that you saw in the Super Barrio Brothers example. Um, you only needed permission to reprint entire musical works. You did not need permission to borrow fragments of musical works or even to perform musical compositions. Um, more, of, more, of our, more of our senses, <coughs> our sense of humor here. Um, this, I mean, amazing details, what you find when you research these people. The poor guy died so, um, so poor that his creditors had to sell his body to medical schools to cover his debts. Um, man, so didn't even, he won the case, but did not really do so well in the, in the long run. Okay, so that's sort of a very, very brief romp through the history of when did copyright law you know, start swimming in this, in this musical pool in the first place. In the US, there, there was a blip too. Our first, our Copyright Act was passed in 1790, did not explicitly cover musical compositions until 1831. Um, and then by analogy to books. So where are we now? Very different world. We have begun to regulate music at the atomic level. So as I described, <coughs> music has a rich and long history of borrowing. And I talked about classical and jazz, but of course this is true across genres and subgenres. Take the blues, which draws from a rich commons of, whoops, of scales, chord progressions, standards. I think this is a particularly beautiful image. This is our, this is our Professor Kelly character jamming with uh, Robert Johnson and the DNA of the blues flowing out of their instruments. Um, or take rock and roll. Recognize these guys. One of them just wrote a book. One of them just would have had a birthday. Um, Keith Richards and John Lennon celebrating the contributions of Chuck Berry to rock and roll and to their music in particular. And um, Professor Aoki, our artist, just really can draw rockers. I think these are particularly good renditions. So across genres, we see this long history of musical borrowing. And until relatively recently, for a variety of reasons, the law, as a general matter, has not interfered with these practices. But this changed with the practice of digital sampling. Today, rap musicians, indeed all musicians, are told to license the tiniest shortest sample when they make songs using fragments from prior ones, even though music has relied on borrowing throughout its history. What was considered creativity and now may be considered high art is now condemned as theft. What happened? These are our digital capers samplers right here. Um, it started in 1991 with a case called Grand Upright in which uh, the rapper Biz Marquis borrowed quite a bit, actually. Um, from Gilbert O'Sullivan's <coughs> Alone Again, Naturally. And the judge in the case um, decided the case with the quote, thou shalt not steal, has been an admonition followed since the dawn of civilization. Citing to the Bible, always got to cite your sources. <laughs> Did the judge discuss any copyright law? No. <laughs> Ten Commandments. Sampling was theft, pure and simple. So that was the first case. And the second case uh, out of the Sixth Circuit in 2005 was where a federal appeals court famously announced, get a license or do not sample. So all samples should be subject to license, to payment, to getting permission. And in this case, the rap group NWA digitally sampled a two-second, three-note guitar riff. So here is the original guitar riff. Uh, George Clinton, but he doesn't own the rights. A company called Bridgeport owns his rights. And pretty good George Clinton, too, in my opinion. Here's the three-note loop. That's what they sampled. Now try, try to hear it in the background 
of the NWA song called 100 Miles and Running. We're not alone with three more brothers. I mean, street brothers. Not wearing my tights because we're not stupid. They have to take our heads for what we said in the past. Quit playing, they can kiss my. Um, we cut out some of the obscenities, you know, for the benefit <laughs> of the audience. There's an unedited version. Um, NWA changed the pitch and the tempo to the point at which it sounds kind of like that police siren in the background, but it's not even recognizable as the original riff, as the original guitar riff. They were sued. And now you might think that this kind of appropriation, this kind of taking, is too trivial to care about. And in fact, in copyright law, we have a doctrine called de minimis, which is Latin for too trivial to care about. <laughs> it is. So, um, in this case, you're like, well, you know, it was three notes, it was two seconds, right? If anything is going to be de minimis, this sounds de minimis to me, but the court said no. How much would count as de minimis copying? The court said maybe one note, maybe, based on a definition of the Copyright Act. So what's happening here? This level of granularity, licensing two or three notes, is completely new. Right, we've looked at this history. This is a new kind of regulation. IP rights are being applied literally down to the atomic level of culture, and tiny fragments of music come loaded with demands for payment um, and copyright protection. And so the result is a kind of stratified culture. You might say, but people are sampling all the time. They are. Musicians are still sampling and experimenting under the radar. But the music being produced by the labels are following the industry norm of licensing all samples. And this actually changes the music that we get. It changes the way the music sounds. Um, so the sample heavy wall of sound uh, music from groups like Public Enemy in the 80s sounds completely different than, for example, whatever his name is now, Puff Daddy's I'll Be Missing You, which has the police's every breath you take just looping on and on in the background, right? There's one sample going on and on, not hundreds or thousands of sample all creating this brilliant sonic wall of sound. And so the licensing practices actually are changing, right? They're changing the conditions of creativity and they're changing the way the music that we get, at least from the mainstream outlets. And the question is, well, these kinds of licensing practices, what, these kinds of cases, are they gonna give us more culture, more art, more creativity? After all, that's the purpose of copyright law, to encourage and promote the production of, um, of art and creativity. I don't think so, if you look at this history. Would jazz, blues, rock, soul, any of these genres have developed the same ways they did under this kind of legal regime? Probably not. So in the law section of your talk, first theme, uh, we have these cases that are regulating music down at the atomic level. That's one unique feature of our current copyright scheme. The other is that copyright law lasts a long, long time. Uh, to quote Professor Boyle, we are the first generation in history to deny our culture to ourselves. What does that mean? Uh, until 1978, the copyright term in the US was 28 years with the option to renew for another 28 years. And most rights holders did not renew because their work wasn't making any money anymore. So what would be the point? So after 28 years, works would fall into the public domain and you could freely do any of these things without having to worry about it because the works were no longer subject to copyright protection. Now, the copyright term is the life of the author plus 70 years, or in the case of corporate works, works owned you know, by, by Disney, by labels, 95 years from publication. So that's a long time. If the people in this room are, say, 30, and you live to, say, 90, if you write something right now, 130 years from now, is when your work is going to go into the public domain. That's very different from 28 years. Um, so as a result, music published since 1923 is presumptively off limits. And if you just think about the law in 1978, under the law then, most music would go into the public domain after 28 years. And so works from the early 80s um, would be free game. Even if the term was renewed, works from 1953 forward would be in the public domain. So the copyright term it's much longer than it used to be, and perhaps even more interestingly, these terms have been retrospectively applied, not just prospectively to new works that are being created, but to works that are already out there, already creative, in many cases applying to dead musicians. 
how did we present that in our comic? This is our adventures of, you know, we, we know the stuff, we research the stuff, and they're like, can we come up with a funny way to present it visually? I think, don't they know the difference between composing and decomposing is actually, I got a credit, that's Boyle again. I do, I do the nerdy research, and then he, and he comes up with these brilliant bubbles, but um, I particularly like that one. So, two changes. Regulating music at the atomic level, the copyright term lasts a long, long time. This is from our previous comic book, Colorized. Um, perhaps upsetting the careful balance, where we saw the balance invoked in the 1909 debates that was built into copyright law between control of works on the one hand and freedom to use those works on the other. So if you look around this audience, absent a conspicuous choice, uh, those of you who write music, putting your music under a Creative Commons license. For example, no piece of culture produced by anyone in this room is going to be part of the culture on which you can build. It's a logical matter. That wasn't true for Brahms or for Beethoven. And when you combine the longer copyright term and the increasingly strict licensing practices that I talked about, you could say that it also wasn't true for Dizzy Gillespie or Robert Johnson, the giants of jazz or blues or rock and roll. And so we do live in very unique times in terms of the legal regime that regulates music. Now, again, maybe this change is a good one. Maybe extremely long copyright terms and licensing practices will give us better music than that created by all of our forebears, but I have to say I am doubtful about that. So tying all these themes together, we have something of a paradox. We have the internet all the little remixing software that comes bundled with your, with your, with your, with your MacBooks. Um, new technologies are offering musicians, regular people, anyone creating music, unprecedented opportunities for creating and for sharing their music. So we could be in the most creative period in history right now. But just as this is happening, the law is tightening control and making more and more of these activities, the remixing, the creating, the sharing, illegal. So we have kind of a split personality between technologically mediated freedom and tightening legal control and practices on the other hand. And the gap between what technology is enabling and what the law is disabling only seems to be growing. So how should we feel about that? And you might say again, what are you talking about? You know, I love girl talk. He's remixing away. There's all this remixing out there. You know, you can complain about what the law says, but people are still doing it. But remember the stratified culture I talked about. So in the realm of the official mainstream culture that survives and is maintained, the rules and business practices are becoming ever more restricted. So the question is, do you want these new kinds of creativity confined to the periphery of mainstream culture? So to sum up, our species, the human race, has a long history with music, and we can actually learn a lot from this history, a lot to inform the music wars, the current debates uh, that we're mired in, that you're learning about in our classes. What are some of the key things we can learn? One, we are frightened, terrified, often bizarrely frightened by remix, the examples I started out with. Two, we're very bad at predicting the effects of new technologies, whether it's notation, whether it's the gramophones, maybe peer-to-peer -peer file sharing now on music. Three, that when change happens, incumbents often claim that the law should control the technological change in the name of an absolute conception of property rights, the kinds of arguments we saw from John Philip Sousa in the 1909 debates. And finally, that the law, the current law, the law we're living with right now has changed the conditions of creativity in two distinct ways, both in the length of the copyright term and in the granularity of control which, if present in the past, might have fundamentally changed the development of much of the music that we love, the classical music, the jazz, the blues, the rock and roll, the folk. And, of course, at this juncture, with these in mind, we face the music wars, the continued debate about the appropriate level of control to deal with the world of the Internet. So, with those lessons in mind, we got the question, where do we go from here? We could go with some of the regulations already being proposed. These have all been out there. Um, losing your internet connections uh, for, for file sharing. Longer copyright terms. 
taking away artists' um, right, this is in the copyright statute, to terminate the recording contracts after a certain number of years. Some of you are writing about this. Hi, Sam. <laughs> okay. So do we go with some of the kinds of regulations we're currently proposing? Or do we go even further? Again, comic book form. We had a lot of fun coming up with these pages. But yes, of course we're invoking 1984. Um, Winston Smith, you tried to play a song on someone else's telescreen. You sang a song in the shower. You thought of a song. That's three strikes. Take your punishment. Proceed to room 1201. That's a, that's a copyright joke. Um, 1201 is a section of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that um, prohibits the circumvention of techn technological measures. Those of you in my class know a lot about it. So. That's the joke there. Uh, another, another legal joke. Um, <laughs> ACTA is the under uh, is, is a treaty being proposed and um, that was negotiated under the veil of secrecy and the argument, it's a, it's a treaty that deals with IP and counterfeiting and the argument was that well, we have to keep it secret in the interest of national security. And um, so that's, that's what ACTA is and one of the arguments that um, is that it doesn't change domestic law when in fact it would seem to change domestic law. So, business as usual, go even further, total control. Or how about this, complete anarchy. <laughs> Rise up and take back their music, their music too. We decided to put the wardrobe malfunction on there just in the interest of. This is particularly nice. I have like a human right to listen to the stuff you wrote. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I don't find any of these futures attractive, including the last one. To say that we might be better off with shorter copyright uh, terms or you know, a better balanced system does not mean that I favor or we favor abolishing copyright altogether or that illicitly downloading music is somehow a human right. This was meant as a joke, right? All of these are, are, are extreme, absurd futures. Um, I just don't want to sacrifice our traditions of free speech and privacy in the process of defending a particular business model. So to conclude, based on all of our research and just sort of this brainstorming about the future, we would like to imagine a more balanced debate going forward in the music wars. That inc includes concerns for the interests of artists. Artists, artists is artists and creators mused together. Artists, <laughs> creators, <laughs> record companies, civil liberties, digital freedom, technological development, taking all of these things into account, not just one side of the picture or another side of the picture. And I'd like us to actually look at musical history like we've been trying to do and learn a little from that and to be perhaps a little more humble and tentative when we seek to change the fundamental components of the way that music, right? Something our species has that long history where the fundamental components of the way that music is made. So that's our lesson going forward. And with that, I will take any questions. Question, Professor Boyle. Yeah, when's the book getting <laughs> <laughs> Well, that kind of depends on us, doesn't it? Um, it's taken us, so it's very, very hard to fit legal concepts into bubbles, I'm telling you, particularly if you tend towards being somewhat verbose, like maybe me. Um, and we've done a ton of research, but um, we also have to conceive of the comic and then actually draw the thing, then actually get the words to fit into the bubbles. And we are, are we, are we not hoping for a spring 2011 we are. release? Yes. So um, it's a tentative, we are hoping, I'm not saying it will, I'm saying we are hoping that the book will be available, fun previews though, um, in sometime in the spring of 2011. Thank you for asking. Professor Kelly. I, do have, I have a question because I'm starting to feel it at a different angle. I, okay. You're strong arming some of the arguments just to make a point, I understand. But I want to ask whether or not the the laws as they bloom and get more controlling and get closer to the city like Godzilla used to. Um, <laughs> we got to put that in the yeah. <laughs> as, as that happens, Sorry, you, you seem to hair. leave out the fact that it's not that you can't control. I mean, you, you brought it up sort of 
yeah. generally, is that people have to get permission and pay for it. And that seems like kind of imposing civility to some degree from my perspective as a creator. And I wonder whether or not, you know, we could sort of see some of those laws in, in a little more in that light in any way. Or are, are you feeling a little like it's going in that direction or? No, this is, this is something I think about a lot. It's, it's not like the law is forbidding you. It's saying you absolutely can't do it and we're gonna take you to room 1201. It's saying you have to get permission and you have to pay for it. So in theory, that's like fine to get permission and pay for it and you can use it. So there are a few issues with that in practice. First, getting permission. So now you get a copyright over anything that you create um, without having to put a copyright notice on it. So you know, you're on the internet and you find some music and it's not gonna have, it's not required to have the little C, you know, year, you know, 2010, Anthony Kelly. And so often it's hard to figure out who to ask for permission in the first place. There are often costs, search costs associated with getting permission. And then the phenomenon of payment, I talked about, I showed the, the standard flat fee, remember the compromise, the song that Congress came up with that said, sure, you know, make all the piano rolls you want, but pay two cents a roll. Well, that's a compulsory license type scheme. In copyright law, there isn't a standard flat rate fee. Um, you can say, hey, you know, Anthony, you know, I want to take that, you know, that wonderful chord you made. You can say, great, that'll be $2 billion. And so um, the phenomenon of payment Payment demands can be so high as to basically foreclose any use, or the artist can say no. And so with that kind of system, it actually seems to favor certain creators over others. So you know, if you're with a label, now I think some percentage, 60 or 70, large percentage of the label's budget actually just goes to clearing samples. Um, you know, if you have a lot of lawyers and you know a lot of people and you have a lot of phone numbers in your Rolodex, then you can get the permission and the payment and deal with it. But if you're underground, you know, if you're sitting in your dorm room or in your apartment and you're trying to figure out what you can use, what you can't use, who to ask for it, how to pay, um, you're disadvantaged compared yeah, to the people. You encourage that person to make the new song up, which could get sampled one day, and then he can enact the same fascist behavior. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because but that's the other thing. Artists are on both sides of the thing, right? You create. So you actually own a copyright in the new stuff you're creating, but you're also a user. You're trying to draw on previous works, and so you do find yourself in, in both, one of my favorite songs of yours is the one with the Michael Jackson. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> I was gonna ask about the it's Jetsons, fair use. The Jetsons <laughs> image. I'm a legal person, it's, 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 total, it's total fair use. Um, <laughs> it's parody. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> and it, it goes da -da 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 -da. it goes And it inverts. But I mean, that's a really good question, and that's a really good point. Um, you know, you can envision a system in which, you know, if, if, if payment is non-discriminatory and flat, it's actually e easy to do. There's some sort of registry system that would be different. And some people are proposing that as a, as, as a, a solution to the sampling problem, as you know, create some sort of streamlined, fair, non-discriminatory way of doing things. But that's not actually the way the system is set up. Sir, uh, would you say that a lot of record companies are trying to actually change the face of music because? Um, a lot of the times when I used to play, they used to, we used to compose lines for various musicians and what have you. And then once they got signed by a band, they would immediately take out all the things we'd written and composed and they were going to pay us royalty as a result. And therefore they were basically strong on the artist basically saying, this is how it's to sound like, we've just signed you, comply and do everything you have to um, for us, and that's that. So all of a sudden all the musicians are not protected at all by that kind of thing. Do you see any kind of image? Is there anything where music is not protected as a result of the copyright they created in that music? Well, so you're talking about the relationship between record labels and the performers or between co composers and the labels. And the problem, one of the problems is the contractual agreements in which the rights to the songs are actually not owned by the creators. They're owned. The, the rights are worked by, by the labels. So those labels, you know, they can choose to put it in a McDonald's ad or choose to take, you know, whatever out and choose the way the song is going to sound. And so you're a musician? Guitar, uh, piano, cellist, mainly. Cellist. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, and of course, I mean, you, do you remember Prince, where he was going around with the word "slave," Prince, or whatever the, the artist formerly known as Prince, or the symbol formerly known as the artist formerly known as Prince, was going around with the, the symbol on his face. But he was protesting this, the feeling of slavery he felt to his record label, and so that is one phenomenon that artists are very concerned about. But we do see, in terms of what you know, technology, the opportunities enabled by technology. Um, we're seeing sort of a sea change now in the way that musicians make music um, because you don't necessarily need a label anymore to get your music out there. You just put it on your MySpace page, your Facebook page, um, 
and so that is changing the dynamics a little bit. And you're seeing some of the indie kind, the, the kinder, gentler indie labels, like our own local, local label, Merge, uh, Arcade Fire Spoon, awesome bands, labels right down the street, um, who actually have sort of different kinds of business models. But the prominent thing, a lot of people are talking about DIY music, do-it-yourself music, um, where it's not the labels, the artist that does all the promotion, all the distributions, putting their stuff out there. And then they're not subject to a label telling them what they can do with their music, how it has to sound. It's entirely their um, choice. But the flip side is the artist is in the position of being a businessman. So I mean, they're sitting there trying to figure out, how do I track how many people are looking at my MySpace page? You know, how do I do merch? How do I do promo? And so instead of just creating the music, they're in a position of having to do all this other stuff, which actually can be quite a burden, and that was one of the functions of labels in the first place. So, but I mean, it's an interesting moment in terms of the new business models and what you're seeing artists do. Yes, in the back. How um, feasible is the change in copyright law that it's kind of compelled and encouraged by international, like, laws and acts that the US has to comply with? So there's, there's two things. Um, so will copyright law change either on the national or international level? So I mentioned the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement ACTA. Um, a lot of copyright law is being made on the international level. Um, and so we have things like these intellectual property treaties that are passed and then the signatories to the treaty all have to comply um, with the provisions in the treaty. And um, one of the features there, one of the goals is to harmonize the global marketplace so um, that we all have the same laws. So you know the law here is the same as the law in the UK, is the same as the law in China. And you can see the benefits from that. But the problem is it's very hard to harmonize downward. Like say you say that you think the term's too long. And there are a lot of economists who have done studies suggesting that the optimal copyright term, really for everyone in terms of incentivizing creativity, is between seven and 25 years. So say, OK, economists have shown that the perfect copyright term is 25 years. Can you harmonize downward? No, because it seems like taking people's rights away, right? It's like, well, you used to have it right, but I'm sorry, your stuff's going to the public domain after 25 years now. And so what you see in terms of the international agreements is we're always harmonizing upward. And so you know, it's a one-way ratchet. And um, sorry to quote you again, Jamie, but Professor Boyle calls it the insane barbershop quartet always harmonizing upward until it's so shrill that only the really young people in the room who can hear those mosquito cell phone sounds can hear it, but we can't, we old people can't hear it anymore. So that's one feature of legal reform is the international um, treaties have that feature where harmonization generally occurs upward, copyright law expands. Um, in terms of legal reform uh, on the domestic stage, uh, I refer you to Congress. They're going to get a lot done. They're definitely going to get around to it. No problem. They can all agree. It's fabulous. Um, there are some bills with bipartisan support, but I'll leave that. So in terms of legal reform, um, it's a tricky game. And that's why you see a lot of innovated private solutions. Where public solutions to copyright issues fail, you see things like Creative Commons, a private solution that allows authors to who create stuff to put them under these Creative Commons licenses that say, hey, I'm an author. I own a copyright in this work. But I actually want you to be able to do certain things with it. I want you to be able to use it commercially. I want you to be able to make just, um, derivative works. And so, or Google Book Search, the notorious or perhaps not notorious Google Book Search, where Google said, you know, there's all these out of print books. No one's able to read them. No one's able to search them. They're just languishing, you know, disintegrating in libraries. And Congress hasn't, you know, passed a law that is going to tell us when we can actually use those books. So we, Google, with our market power and our muscle, we're just going to go take the books and scan them ourselves and make a searchable database. And so when, when legislative bodies are not acting, we see um, private bodies trying to solve some of these problems. Yes? Um, I think over the next few years, we're going to see the rise of a phenomenon where you, can't, where you don't own music that you bought. Um, you know, you put music into the cloud and you license it, so you pay $10 a month for the rest of your life to listen to music that you paid for. Um, and it's going to be a lot harder to download it or file share it or take it and rip it up um, and use it for your own music. How do you, how do you see that affecting um, the music business and copyright law over the next? Well, so that's a, that's a tricky feature of owning things now in digital instead of analog format. So when you used to buy a tape or you used to buy a CD, you knew you could do certain things with it. You know, I could give my CD to Jed and be like, hey, Jed, you know, listen to the CD, enjoy it. Um, I could do certain things. Now when your music is zeros and ones, right, it's a digital file, it can first of all come with digital rights management. 
that, for instance, says, ha, you burned your iTunes song on five devices, that's it. You can't do that anymore. Or say you buy it from a place and they go out of business and the authentication can't happen anymore, so your music won't play, um, et cetera. And it may also come with various license agreements. And so we're seeing this interesting shift from the analog world where, yes, there were copyrights, but you had certain things physically, you know, listen to, sharing with friends that you could do with your cultural products, including music. And now in the digital world, it's a digital file and may come coded with basically rights and limitations um, that tell you what you can and cannot do with it. Um, so how do I see that playing out? In the area of music, there has been some pushback. Um, consumers really don't like digital rights management on music. There was a notorious instance in 2006 where Sony BMG was selling copy protected CDs and when you put them in your computer, it would install a rootkit that made your computer um, more vulnerable to malware, and so it was basically compromising the security of people's home computers. Just your CD, it's like, oh, that's my great new CD. Oh, I want to listen to it. What? What? My computer? And so, you know, that was one instance in which the PR was so bad. Um, and consumers just don't like digital rights management on their music. So the market, in the market, there is some pushback to that. Um, in terms of how it affects the law, the law actually does regulate. The law um, uh, makes it illegal to crack those kinds of management schemes, and also there is some protection for the contracts that, that dictate the terms of what you should be able to do with your music. But I mean, that is, that is a huge shift, the fact that all of our stuff is now digital, right? And it completely changes your assumptions about what, as a practical matter, even outside the confines of the law, you can do with your stuff. And so it's, it's, a, it's a key, a very interesting question, and my people in my class have heard about it over and over again. Um, you had a question. Yes. Um, when you talked about who's protected by copyright, it seemed yeah. mostly based on the author or the composer. You gave that impression. But when you talked about sampling, it's more about what the actual recorded document is, the, the actual sounds. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a wide range of things between <coughs> what someone is actually writing and how it's performed, how it's engineered. Are there various levels of copyright and protections for all the people in between? There aren't. There, so there are in music, unusually, two different kinds of copyright protection that are different and with different authors and people. Um, all, um, so, so say I have a CD, oh God, am I gonna mention? I, I just, it came to me, Guns N' Roses, <laughs> remaking Knock Knock, Knocking on Heaven's Door. That's a really dated example. Okay, so here's my CD. Um, there's a musical composition copyright, which is basically on what you would see on a page. So the music and the lyrics, that's owned by Bob Dylan or, or his publishing house, because he wrote the song. But there's another copyright in the CD, and it's over the sound recording. And that is owned by the performer or the record label, so that's owned by Guns N' Roses. So there's two different copyrights. There's Dylan, I wrote the words and the music, and there's Guns N' Roses, Axel Rose. Sorry. <laughs> and, you know, I performed this. And so, um, so the license, the rights structure and licensing structure in music is insanely complicated, because as I said, you don't necessarily know who owns it. In a lot of cases, it's a publishing house and a label that owns those different rights. And then you mentioned, um, you know, what about all the people who contributed, say, to a performance? You got the sound engineers, you know, you got the backup singers, you got all these people on there, right? Um, who are the real authors? What is their status? That's an open, very interesting legal question. And so the system, the, the multiplicity of rights and revenue streams associated with a given piece of music is insanely complicated. And um, I'll be teaching a course about it in the spring. Let's wrap up. Thank you very much. Thanks. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.